Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today, I'm here with Brent Parker, founder and managing partner of Vision Capital, a micro PE firm first focused on blue collar enterprises. Welcome, Brent. Thank you for being on the show today, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I, I, everybody that watches the show, and they know what my first question is always going to be, kind of your origin story, man. You were born, mom had you, you roamed around, you know, and then all of a sudden you find yourself on a mergers and acquisitions podcast. How did you get here? How did you end up on my show today? (laughs) <laughs> All right. Well, a lot of groundwork there to cover, uh, but I'll try to keep it brief. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, <clears throat> well, so I kind of come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, I think I like to give credit to my grandpa. It all started back with him. He was uh, grew up in the Depression, and he started selling uh, outboard motors in a Cadillac dealership in Nashville, North Carolina. So that was kind of the genesis of the Parker Entrepreneurs Um he moved to Orlando, Florida, opened up a boat dealership there. Uh, my dad took over the boat dealership. That was in our family for about 90 years. And so boating was just part of our, our lifestyle. Um, I have two other brothers that are also in entrepreneurship. So uh, our family role was you had to go to college and uh, make mistakes with somebody else's money before we came back and made mistakes with dad's money. So um, I was in college and my dad actually sold the business. So then I kind of had to chart a different path. So I got my accounting degree. I went and worked for Deloitte doing taxes uh, for high net worth uh, for privately held companies. Uh, a lot of times you can get stuck on a big public company, but I positioned myself to work on a, the private companies so I could get exposure to you know, 50 or 60 different uh, companies a year. Um, and that was awesome. Learned a lot and gained a lot of experience there. And then I found it was time to go, and my brother uh, found out about this Freedom Boat Club franchise. So I looked into that, and I was like, man, that's cool. And uh, he's making a lot more money than I am and having a lot more fun than I am. So uh, I quit my job, sold my house. At that time, we were living in Houston, Texas, and moved across the country to Virginia, a state that I'd never been to before, but thought it was a good idea to open up a business there. So (laughs) we took a little bit of a risk, uh, rolled the dice. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. It worked out for us. So we moved to Virginia in 2017 and started a Freedom Boat Club franchise there. And I think the franchise told me that I was the the fastest ever onboarded franchise because I was so excited. And uh, luckily, I had connections already in the industry. So I was able to source boats and uh, find employees and sign a lease with a marina. And and we were off. So, um, yeah, so I did that for five years. We, We grew. That business model was taught me a lot. Uh, We bought boats direct from manufacturers. Uh, I had a team of mechanics and dock staff and captains that would train people to use them, maintenance the boats, wash the boats, take care of everything on the back end. And then we would just sell a membership. And that was our revenue model. We'd sell a membership, people would pay an entry fee, monthly dues, and then they had unlimited access to our boats. And it was a franchise network, so they could use boats anywhere in the country too, which was kind of cool. So when we're talking to people, like, yeah, you could you know, spend a hundred grand on a boat or you could, you know, pay three fifty a month and use our boats and use boats in Florida, use boats in San Francisco, use boats in Boston. Like, where are you traveling? You know, like let's go boating. So it, it was really cool. And, um, one of the things in, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but one of the really cool things I learned was the power of a recurring revenue model. Um, so <clears throat> anyways, did that for five years and my uh, my family, my wife and I and kids, we thought it was time to move a little bit uh, closer to family. So we moved back here to Utah. And um, so that kind of led for me exiting the Freedom Book Club franchise in Virginia and entering into this micro private equity phase where um, I'm buying and selling blue collar businesses. That's which awesome. Is really fun. Now, where, where was this in Virginia? I actually, uh, I lived there for a little while, but uh, just because I was in the military, I was stationed there for a few years. Oh, yeah. So uh, we actually had four locations by the time we left between Woodbridge all the way down to Richmond. So yeah. we had two in the Potomac River, one out in, 
on Lake Anna by Charlottesville, where UVA is, and then one in downtown Richmond, right in the heart. It was so pretty. So, yeah, I was actually at uh, Newport News area. I was at uh, Langley Air Force Base, and then oh, cool. I, I, I hung out a lot down at Virginia Beach because it was about a twenty-five thirty-minute drive. So yeah, uh, I was out there for a few years. Uh, then I lived in Hawaii for three uh, three years after that. So that was cool. But uh, so you went from you know your entrepreneurialism in your blood. You're, you you uh, you get out of college. Dad's already sold the business. You start uh, this recurring revenue model franchise uh, franchise based. What made the shift from like okay, I'm a I'm gonna buy a franchise that has systems, processes, and everything all ready together to creating a, a micro PE firm where you're buying blue collar businesses, which in many cases, depending on the size, may or may not have such well-developed standard operating procedures and everything. So what, um, what made the shift there? Is that just something that came available or? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, the franchise for me was a great first business. I learned a lot, right? Cause you're kind of riding on the coattails of people that have been successful at it before you and giving you a game plan. Um, so that was part of my education. And once I had learned that and felt confident in running a business and all the different facets of business, then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go search for industries where there's opportunities to implement these things that I've learned. And blue collar is one of those kind of like gold mines for opportunities. You have a lot of business owners that are tradesmen and not like refined business minded people. So they're really good at a couple things, but as far as marketing, selling, and scaling a business, uh, they might fall short just because they don't have that background or that exposure. So, um, yeah, so that was it. We wanted to go and try taking uh, the things that we learned from the franchise model and putting it into this blue collar space. Now, micro private equity firm could mean a lot of different things. That's a really broad phrase. What exactly is it you guys are uh, wanting to do? Are you investing in companies? Are you acquiring them? And then, you know, I mean, tell me a little bit about more about what your plan is. Yeah, that's a great question. So micro, micro private equity is really the best title that kind of that we fall in. But um, even within that, there could be differences. So the basics is. Uh, we look for companies that are $5 million in acquisition value or less, right? So that's our target. Mm -hmm. um, when you get over $5 million, you start to get sophisticated money that's looking at those companies. Um, but most search funds, PE funds, they have minimums, which are either $5 million or $10 million. And so we figured, hey, if we stay under that $5 million mark, we can find some pretty good businesses um, with some pretty good value and, uh, and, and make some good money. So... Our strategy is kind of a roll-up strategy. We'll go buy three or four of those sub $5 million companies and roll them up and then have a 10 or $15 million company that we can grow and sell off. So, okay. So the uh, the objective is to kind of, uh, I would hate to use flip because it's not an overnight thing, like a, a piece of real estate or something, but you're buying them, bolting them together, and then having an exit event you know, in a, a set period of time. Yeah, Exactly. Okay. Cool. So we're looking at probably five years. I mean, that's our that's our barometer for what we need to get done and how we need you know when we, by the time we need to build it, it needs to be five years so that way we can start looking for. Yeah, I kind year. of expected it to be three to five, right? Three to three at the earliest five would be normal. So yeah, yeah. So um, let's talk about a little bit about like you know, your are you looking anywhere or is it just in your local area? Yeah, right now we're predominantly looking in Utah. Um, in the, I mean, the first market we entered was water softeners. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, there's a lot of PE activity around HVAC companies because these PE funds have found that they can go into a business that people have viewed as transactional in the past and make a recurring revenue model out of it with service contracts and, you know, charging a hundred dollars a year to 20,000 customers, you're making a lot of money, right? Right. And actual there's a lot of safety in that and investors like that so um water softeners is one of those areas where we think it's similar there's an opportunity to go in with a broad range of customers get service contracts going and create a recurring revenue model awesome now so water softeners now i live here in oklahoma i don't know too <laughs> yeah, many people that use them 
right? It all depends. Like, I think you live in an area where there's a lot more stone and a lot more like minerals in the water. So that's what it's, it's about, right? It's ba yeah. basically about neutralizing the, the heavy minerals in the water. Is, now, is that a filtration system or is it adding something to it? Yeah. So we kind of do everything. So we st like water softeners is our bread, our bread and butter. And that essentially takes out the hard water spots and makes it so that you don't get that staining on your glass doors and your dishes and your appliances and stuff like that. But we also do water filtration. So we'll do reverse osmosis filtration, which is like, you know, equal to equivalent to bottled water that you can have right from your kitchen sink. Uh, we do well water treatment and stuff like that. So Awesome. So you've, you're still, you know, the interesting thing is you followed a theme, right? You notice you're still messing with water, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's what, yeah, people, when people ask me the connection, I'm like, well, I'm still playing with water. So. Still, still playing, <laughs> still, still playing with water. Um, I'm really curious about this. You, uh, you seem to make that shift pretty, pretty easily. Now I'm doing the same thing as far as like, you know, you make the shift up there. How long do you think it took before you actually just like, did you already have a business set up up there or did you move and figure it out? Yeah. So I did it all kind of backwards. So I, I bought my business before I sold my franchise. Um, and it was just cause the opportunity came up. I, had, I had decided I wanted to, in my last business, I was the sole owner. And then in my next business, I had two good friends from college that are really sharp that I wanted to partner with. And so <clears throat> the one friend owns a valuations firm and he had a deal that he valued where the buyer backed out and they had developed a relationship then the seller came to him and said, Hey, do you know anybody that'd be interesting, interested in buying my business? And then that's where he introduced me. We kind of put our partnership together. I'd been pitching my two friends on this idea for a couple of years now. Um, and it all moved pretty quick from there. So. Awesome. Now a micro PE firm. Um, uh, I think that just tends to be the, you know, the size of deals you're doing that 5 million or less, right? It doesn't have mm -hmm. anything to do with how big you're going to give me on the other side. So uh, I had Ace Chapman on here and he's real big into that. I was telling you this before the show. He does the micro PE where he does a small raise, three to $5 million, goes out and, and buys things. Now, when you say three, uh, $5 million, is that the acquisition price? So it could be an EBITDA company of, you know, uh, it could be as far as like a like two, two and a half million dollar EBITDA uh, company, um, that you're looking at, or is that the revenue size that you're looking for? Yeah. So typically, um, in this industry, you'll find a three to five times multiple on, you know, earnings, sellers, discretionary earnings. And so, yeah, that's essentially what we bought. We bought an $800,000 EBITDA company at a four multiple. And okay. that was under our 5 million mark. Well, that's the name of the game, right? Just a lot of people think this is a, a game of numbers and you're trying to buy EBITDA or you're trying to buy a, a revenue stream. And if you only look at it that way, you're missing this out. And this is a common theme for most of the last four or five shows where I talk about it. Anyway, it's the human element of this, right? You, you said something very important there. You were happy and they were happy. And, and that's that these deals fall apart so fast. If one party's trying to get what they're trying to get and not hearing out the other party. So I love that you, you adapted, right? He wanted a certain multiple. You're like, okay, you can have that multiple. And uh, it's kind of the old school rule of, you know, he who sets the term, the other one sets the price. So it's, <laughs> if it's my price in your terms or your terms in my price, right? Yeah. So uh, that's, that's normally the rule of uh, like the default rule of negotiations. So uh, in your right. case, <clears throat> you have a friend who had a valuation company. He valued the company. And um, did, were you at that valuation or close to it when you, when you ended up at the end of the deal? Um, yeah. So I was a part of the due diligence and I mean, he had told me what the valuation was prior to us entering due diligence um, just as a means of like, Hey, this isn't the right size that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we did was we essentially delivered an LOI with a formula. So, we said, hey, we'll do, you know, this is our formula. It's kind of a weighted average seller's discretionary earnings. So we took 50% of 2020, 25% of 2019, and 25% of 2018, just to kind of eliminate any effect or mitigate any effect there could have been up or down due to COVID. And then we'll give you a four multiple. And so as a result, we had a really good baseline. And then when we got into due diligence, we drilled down, found that exact number, and then that's what the purchase price ended up being. It wasn't like we threw out a number, hey, we'll pay you, you know, $4 million. 
we kind of laid out a formula, which I think is a little unique, but it ended up working well with this um, seller. No, I like it just because it opens up, it, op it opens up the opportunity during due diligence to find something and have that number shift. And it also, it kind of puts them on, on notice, like, look, oh yeah, I'll, you know, uh, instead of paying and saying, I'll pay, you say your revenue is, or your EBITDA is a million and I'll pay you four X, I'll pay 4 million. You know, you just say, you know, if you're, if your letter of intent says we'll pay, um, you know, four X the audited EBITDA and, you know, here's the criteria for what, what goes into that. That makes a huge difference because then if if they have brokers involved or other people involved and things were added in or adjusted that just don't make sense and it happens a lot a lot more than most people would imagine if you're not an if you're not an acquisition entrepreneur just understand that a lot of times things are added in or moved around to make the number look bigger than it should be so that gets adjusted out <laughs> when we see it right yeah. so uh so I, I love the idea of, of putting that in uh one of the last LOIs that I sent out was that way. I just put a formula in there mainly because I didn't have the, their books were so bad. I did not have the information I needed to make the number. So, and I really wanted the business and I had, I already had a forensic CPA team that could put the books back together the way it should. So there, there, there's, there, it, it appeared to be something good there. So I wrote it up as like the, you know, something like, look, we're going to, you know, same thing. We're going to give you a, uh, we're going to clean up your books. We're going to make the adjustments we're going to need. And we're both going to agree on it, that that's what it looks like. We're going to both uh, uh, agree that that's what it's going to look like. And then I'm going to pay you a certain multiple on, on that finished number. And then they agreed beforehand and verbally. And then we put that in the LOI. So um, it's, it might be a little more common than, than we would expect just because it's just logical to do that. So tell me a little bit about like, what are you learning? Like, how, how long have you been doing this now? You've, you've earned the private equity. I didn't look at your, I should have pulled up your profile ahead of time, looked at your LinkedIn to see when you started Vision Capital, but how long has Vision Capital been around? Yeah. So we're at our year anniversary. This awesome. Month, so, yeah. So you've been at it a year, you've made at least one acquisition, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. and you're out there looking for others. What are you learning out there in the space that like, man, uh, I'm glad I've seen this now before I do my second one, or is there any valuable lessons you're picking up along the way here? Yeah. I mean, valuable or not, a couple of lessons that I'm learning is one, um, when you go in and acquire a company, there's, uh, you got to go at the pace, the team is willing to let you go. Right. So there's existing employees with existing processes and as, um, the, the buyer, you obviously see opportunity, right? So that means change. You see changes that you want to come in and make. But what we found is to, you know, have all, those, have, have all those ideas, but then let your team help you set the pace. Because if we had, you know, 10 ideas and then just tried to ram it down everybody's throat, we'd lose all of our employees. And then we'd be stuck with, you know, a business with brand new owners and brand new employees. And those employees have a wealth of knowledge that we want to keep and utilize. And so we kind of have to, you know, um, leverage that and also go, uh, you know, go at their speed. So that's been one of the things that I've learned is, uh, go at their speed and, um, yeah. And then, you know, we've, but as a result, we've been able to maintain a hundred percent of our employees. It's been pretty cool. It's interesting. I did a whole series here where I mentor, I did uh, meet the mentor where I actually interviewed uh, a bunch of the guys that mentor this space. And more than one of them, I asked them, like, when you buy a company, how fast do you make changes? And more than one of them were like, I don't change anything for the first 30 days. And then I make a list of things. I, like on day one, I know I've got 10 things I need to change. And then I keep those noted. And when I have meetings, I ask questions that would say, hey, I see this is an issue. How would you guys like to solve it? And very, he said, very often they already know what needs to be changed and they suggest it and come up with things that are on my list and I could just check them off and it's on them, right? Cause they've been, it's something they've been wanting to change or do something differently for a long time. And the previous owner was doing things the way they've always done it. And he goes, but if I don't do it that way, you know, um, you know, I have more problems than I create solutions for. So I love that concept. He, 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 one of the guys gave me a horror story where he, he bought a company and it was like one of the companies he had now. So it was kind of a bolt on where they buy, like you would buy another water filtration company it would be a bolt on to what you already do. Right. 
and you would have some synergies. And the first thing he did is like, well, I don't need two office managers. So he let the office manager go at company B, the one he just bought. And the whole place almost fell apart because I'm not it's come to find out not only was she the office manager, she ordered everybody's supplies. She tra- she booked everybody's travel. She was the executive admin to the, the other VPs and execs there. She did basically she was more of a general manager than she ever was a office manager. And like like things just started running out. People couldn't know how to book travel. They didn't know where their accounts were. They couldn't ship anything. She had all the shipping codes and stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. uh I get, I get just kind of acquiring, acquiring the business and then observing and, and making changes at the pace that the team can go. Is there anything else that you picked up, you know, in this, in this first year of doing this? Yeah. And also as a follow on to that point, you know, you don't know what like um, IP or Intel is kept in the minds of the employees versus written down on paper. So if you go too fast and run off some of your key employees, there could be a significant asset of the business that leaves with that employee. So that's also important is to, and that's kind of what we've done is get, gotten a system that was dependent on people and paper. They were very paper dependent um, to be you know, software and automated, still using the same people, but it made their job easier and it got all the processes kind of out of their brains and into, into a system that will kind of live on beyond them if they ever choose to leave. So now you call, you guys call yourself a, a PE firm. Did you actually go out and create like a private play, placement memorandum, do a round of funding, raise funds. You guys pitch in your own money. Of course, they always require that, but, or did you, are you guys using things like the SBA and leverage buyouts and that type of stuff? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we just use our own money and then got an SBA loan. Um, so self-funded and um, eventually we might need to go out and raise funds but I think for the first few acquisitions we'll probably be able to maintain it just internally with the partners awesome now the uh, how did you like the process of the SBA loan because I heard closing I, I had one of the guys on here that's all he does he uh, it was actually uh, last week uh, we talked to a guy who uh, he facilitates SBA loans and even he said closing one is an ordeal yes no, it's terrible. Like uh, there, there are many other things in life I'd prefer to sit through or endure than an SBA loan application. It was pretty miserable. Luckily, uh, m- my business partner that does uh, valuations, he's really good at paperwork and all that kind of stuff. So he carried a large part of it. And then my other partner is an M&A attorney. So um, he was also able to help us out there. But man, no, it, it was difficult and it was slow. And but you know, it was, in my opinion, it was worth it. Um, well, I don't know if somebody had private money and offered me half a percent more without all the paperwork, I probably would have taken that, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got a good interest rate. And, uh, the money came through. So it's one of those things. Once you've gone through the ringer, you kind of forget some of the bad, but yeah, I, I remember, you know, it delayed our closing. I flew out. They said, okay, we'll be ready to close on the 14th. I flew out to Utah. I was still living in Virginia. And geez, I mean, it was two weeks later. I had to postpone my flight. I brought my family with me. I mean, we were out here just because they couldn't get it closed in time. So it's always the case. That's interesting. You said you'd paid more. I had a real estate investment group and uh, somebody said, well, how many bank loans do you have? I was like, I've never taken a bank loan. Why would you, why would you do that? I said, they take too long to close. I'm buying foreclosures. Once the bank says, yes, I have like 30 days or less to close. Right. I've seen a lot of short sales and, and, you know, foreclosure type of sales, bust because like I bought a bunch of them as a matter of fact that bust because the uh, the banks failed to close in time right so yeah. I, used to, I used to train the local uh uh closing companies around here hey I've got money lined up if you've got a deal that bust call me and I can close within four to five hours if you can get the bank to say okay right yeah I just wire them you know and it wasn't just my money and somebody said well how much of these, how much you paying your investors? Like people to loan you money to, to buy the houses. I said between nine and 10%. He goes, but you can get investor loans at six to, to you know, six or 7%. I was like all day long, but then I got to wait 45 days and all half my deals are gone. So I, I, yeah. I laughed hard because I, I, you know, in all the years I ran my uh, real estate investment group, uh, I never took a single bank loan ever. So, um, yeah, as funny as I, as all the real estate I own, I've never had a mortgage that was mine. Right. I, to this day, I paid cash for the house I live in, which is just a little farm, farmhouse. 
And uh, we we primarily travel around and live in a tiny home when we move. So we have one of those two, which we pay you know cash for. But I've never taken a formal mortgage. It's always through private lenders and through raising money and stuff. So I totally get that concept. Of stuff. You know, I'd pay a point or more <laughs> or a half a point yeah. or more, you know, <laughs> not to have to deal with it. You know, and and sometimes there are deals you're going to run across. And that's a good thing to put out there because that you're willing to pay a little bit more for an investor because somebody might hear that. There are deals that if you try to do SBA on are going to bust. You run into yeah. a 75-year-old a uh, you know, company or 75-year-old uh, business owner who has medical conditions, and you tell him it takes four to 10 weeks or four to 12 weeks for a SBA loan to close, he might choose the next buyer. Uh, I've known more than one broker friend that has said, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's so funny that you say that. There's... I mean, a friend of mine had a, a small deal. He was selling a business for $150,000 and the buyers were getting an SBA loan and it took them literally six extra weeks beyond what they said. And they had like, they were going on a big vacation to Hawaii. They, they, they filed the paperwork, they signed the paperwork, you know, depending on the closing of the loan. And they thought that was going to happen while they were out on this month long vacation. And man, they were back home before it closed, <laughs> you know, so... And yeah, anyways, yeah, there's, there's something to speed uh, yeah. of capital. So velocity of money, right? There's a, there's something to the, just the speed of it. So if you're listening out there and you're thinking, I'm going to buy a business, I'm going to use an SBA loan. That's awesome. Do it. Uh, I totally, and I got people that can help you out doing it. Uh, just understand whatever you think it's going to close that add about six to eight weeks onto it. Cause that just to be safe, it's very possibly going to have, you know, six to eight weeks at the end of, of you jumping through red tape. The other thing you want to know inside of that space, and I'm sure you feel that you're going to personally guarantee everything you got against it. Yep. No, absolutely. I mean, my house has a personal guarantee on it. No, they, they love to tie you up with personal guarantees. So, and if yeah. you're new to them, it feels really scary, but, uh, as when you're when you've been in entrepreneurship for a little while, you kind of get used to them. So, <laughs> so that is, uh, yes. I, I'm resistant to it. I mean, everything I own is in trust and everything else to protect it and make sure it's safe. And like, if something happens to me or whatever, one of the business I own, it can't bleed into the others. So, to personal guarantee across multiple trusts and LLCs and stuff would you know would absolutely terrify me. And I've been in this space for a while. Yeah, well, no, you look a lot smarter than me, so I'll, I'll try to take a page out of your book. That's uh, the it's the old guy with the gray beard. And, you know, <laughs> uh, I would doubt that I, I we we have about the same education level. I have a master's degree too. You went to probably a better school, but I wouldn't put that on me at all. Um, let's talk about let's just talk about the whole process here. What what is your search criteria, and how are you going about looking for businesses? Because there's a lot of guys out there listening to the show. They haven't acquired their first. They're really wanting to, and they're just trying to figure out. Um, I know how you acquired that one. It was a referral, but what is your process or your game plan now to add to it? Yeah. I mean, there's different ways to go about it, but right now for me, I'm in an industry I've chosen it. And so now I'm my next business. I'm just going to call the business owners, right? I'm going to look up on the internet. I'm going to Google water softener companies and I'm going to call every one of them and see who's ready for a deal. And I'm going to prioritize by a few criteria that I can see online. Um, but yeah, that, that's the way I'm going to do it. And anybody could do it realistically that way if you've picked an industry. A lot of times people have a hard time picking an industry right off the bat. And so my advice then is just network, right? Network with business brokers, with lawyers and attorneys. These are all people that are going to be having conversations when business owners are ready to sell or thinking about selling. And so networking is a great way to find business opportunities as well. Um, as I've networked, I've had a bunch of opportunities come my way. And, you know, not that I've taken all of them or, or many of them, but as you, as you network, they start to flow. So, you know, <clears throat> don't overlook uh, LinkedIn. I tell you what, we, uh, we did a roll up last year for marketing agencies and we sourced, um, Every single one of them, I say every single, about 95% of them were sourced through LinkedIn. And um, in a matter of less than 200 days, I always say around 200 days, but it was like 187 if you want to get technical. I guess it depends on who, who you ask when we started sourcing, but uh, there's a little variance there. But 
Um, I hate when people call me out stuff. So I ended up correcting myself a bunch of things. Right? <laughs> it only took one 50 days you know, or whatever, but, uh, somewhere in that. So none of the numbers I say are factual or accurate. I'm just guessing here. Oh, um, <laughs> just a disclaimer. There. This is, there's my disclaimer, but we talked to, I have a stack of over 200, I think it was 211 marketing agencies in that time frame, And it was all sourced through reaching out on LinkedIn to market. You know, you've got to remember marketing agencies are predominantly on LinkedIn because they're using it. Right. So they're easy right. to reach. Now, what are softening companies? I just did a search while we were talking and it concludes all their employees, but I'm personally connected to, if you know how LinkedIn search works, cause you only get to go to your first, second and third. I'm personally connected to 6,500 people who have water softener in their title somewhere. Right. So it might be a CEO of a water softening company or this one, like the one I'm looking water softener engineer, you know, general manager, uh, CO2 water softener. Like I've got a bunch of these people here, but, you know, that's huge in the fact that you could go, hey, we just acquired one world. You know, the, the comment is you can make connections inside of LinkedIn, like you're networking and just uh, start with a very soft approach. Hey, I, we, we bought one. We want to be connected to other people in the industry. Uh, we'd be willing to acquire others. Who do you know? You know, type of thing. And uh, I would be surprised if you couldn't connect to probably if you reached out to every one of these guys, you know, 6,500 of them that I see and not just tell, there's just that phrase alone. I would be surprised if you don't even if you don't get at least a, a 30 or 40 percent just connection, right? Where you're connected to the industry at that point. And then it's just a matter of just keeping the word out that you're on the you know, on the prowl. Right. Because yeah. everything changes with time and circumstances. It was my favorite saying inside of the real estate business, and it still holds true here. Somebody might see your post, and I've had people, I tried direct mail, I tried a bunch of other stuff inside of the space. And, and, you know, people respond four or five months later. They write down your name, your number, your information because they're thinking, I don't want to sell now, but ah, man, I might. And then they start jotting that information down. Right. I have notes around here um, of people who, you know, like, I caught something on their LinkedIn. So, you know, I might sell this soon. So I reached out to him like, yeah, not quite yet. So I got notes on my CRM says, call this guy in six months. Right. Yeah. But same thing goes here. I honestly think you could have a big one, uh, a big connection. The other thing I would suggest, and just because I'm, I specialize in finding stuff, I have friends that I'm finding stuff for, and that's kind of what I do. I find businesses. And um, this is one of the reasons the show exists is so I get opportunities brought to me. The other one is uh, going to your industry. Um, uh, you know, like if I'm looking for manufacturers in Oklahoma, there's, there is a Oklahoma Manufacturers uh, Association, right? I guarantee there probably may not, there may or may not be a water softener association, but there's some type of manufacturing association similar to it or connected to it. And you get in there, you get connected, you start talking to, sorry, you start talking to, uh, you know, the people in the industry and just keep the word out. That's like, I'm looking for other opportunities in this space and uh, they'll be there. So. Yeah, no, networking is huge. And yeah, it, it's as you also introduce the idea to people, you know, even if they weren't thinking out about it before, once you introduce it to them, they're not going to forget it. Right. And, and that's what happens. You, you drop, you plant the seed a year later, you know, that, that person is probably going to be ready as, as you keep, nur you know, nurturing that seed. Now, if you're looking at this and you're looking at like, I'm going to buy other water filtration company or, or water softening companies, or you're also looking at also water filtration or, or other products along that line. Yeah. So I think we're going to be selective with things that are either residential or commercial that we can have service contracts for. So, you know, water filtration is great because we need to go change filters, you know, every six to 12 months. Um, water softener, same thing. We need to go do, you know, resin cleaning and, you know, check the settings and things like that. So those are the things that we're going to focus for, uh, focus on. And so, but anything within that spectrum we'd be interested in. I just like to brainstorm ideas. And this is a fun avenue to do that. What about pool service companies? If you think about it, they have filtration systems, right? They're for sale everywhere. You can buy pool routes, like the cleaning, uh, the routes and stuff for mm -hmm. uh, 1X. Yeah. You can buy these routes out, up for 1X. They're all over the place. That's the, one of the only ones I've ever seen that predominantly sell for 1X revenue. So a pool route's generating you know, $150,000 a year in revenue. And... Um, you know, it's, I said one X, whatever it was, one X, uh, seller's discretionary earnings. Let's say it's, it's pretty 
um, profitable. These things are pretty profitable. So that, you know, at one hundred and fifty thousand, they're probably doing one hundred and twenty to one hundred and thirty in their seller's discretionary earnings, and you can buy it for one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty all day long. And then they're they're mm-hmm. just all over. They're represented by brokers or personal. But if you think about it, it's service contract. It's water. There's there's, fil- there's filters and and uh, and other you know systems to put in place. And then it's pretty easy to upsell them to, hey, the water we put in here is pretty hard. You need a hot water softener before we put it in through this chemical system, right? Like mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're killing your filtration because it's the water's too hard coming into it. So it might be a cross-sell and upsell event. So uh, that, that's one thing I was thinking about. And the other thing is, is, you know, would you consider buying one of the manufacturers of a product you use for, in your supply chain, like the filters, right? If you bought the filter producing company or uh, the wholesaler that wholesales the filters, um, you know, one of the things to expand on businesses often would be like to look at your suppliers. Is that something you would be interested in? You know, for me, I'm open to all ideas, but what we, you know, we have kind of a thesis, we have a goal. And so Mm -hmm. anything that falls within that, then we'd be interested in entertaining. So essentially we're interested in rolling up, and creating an opportunity by taking a transactional business and converting it into some percentage, you know, I understand it's not going to be hundred percent, but some percentage of a recurring revenue business. So anything within that, um, we'd be interested in entertaining. And if a manufacturer did fall into that, it would be, you know, we'd grown to a much larger scale and we would capture huge efficiencies by doing it. You know, I think we kind of view the end in mind, Hey, how's this going to help us sell the, you know, sell, sell the company or the companies. So, you know, I've got two spaces I'm looking at. One of them is home services. I own a local pest control. I always bring it up here just because it's one of the things I do own. Um, but other home services, like your water softener company would be considered home services. You could, and I've, I'm a big fan. I'm from the real estate world. So I'm also a big fan of recurring yeah. revenue, you know, creating that. So, uh, like I have uh, a lot of my clients in that, uh, pest control company are like Airbnb clients. And we go check, we do an inspection and a, and a cracks and crevices touch up almost mm-hmm. monthly on a lot of them. Just, we, we go and inspect them for bed bugs. And then, uh, you know, since they have people moving in and out, we'll hit the cracks and crevices, um, you know, uh, just on, on a monthly. And we, we have a bunch of those guys at $89 a month. So same thing with some of the other home services would definitely be easy to convert. Um, a lot of P and E firms are out there buying up, which is like, I think in the last two years, it picked up a lot, uh, things like landscaping and lawn care type of stuff. So when you say, uh, recurring revenue, you know, private and commercial, um, are you open up to all those other areas or pretty much around the water space? Two spaces I'm looking at. One of them is home services. I own a local pest control. I always bring it up here just because it's one of the things I do own. Um, but other home services like your water softener company would be considered home services. You could, and I've, I'm a big fan. I'm from the real estate world. So I'm also a big fan of recurring yeah. revenue, you know, creating that. So, uh, like I have uh, a lot of my clients in that, uh, pest control company are like Airbnb clients. So we go check, we do an inspection and a, and a cracks and crevices touch up almost mm-hmm. monthly on a lot of them. Just, we, we go and inspect them for bed bugs. And then, uh, you know, since they have people moving in and out, we'll hit the cracks and crevices. Um, you know, uh, just on a monthly and we we have a bunch of those guys at $89 a month. So same thing with some of the other home services would definitely be easy to convert. Um, a lot of P&E firms are out there buying up, which is like I think in the last two years, it picked up a lot. Uh, things like landscaping and lawn care type of stuff. So when you say uh, recurring revenue, you know, private and commercial, um, are you open up to all those other areas or pretty much around the water space? You know, there'll be other opportunities to expand into, you know, socks or hunting equipment or basketballs. But, you know, <laughs> do those la- do those later with a different LLC. Don't don't try to don't try to do the everything model. I love it. That's curious because uh, the way you explained it at first, I was like, is he going to have like two or three roll ups he's putting together or, you know, or is it just the water? So we, we got that cleared up. Cool. Um, I'm just kind of just we keep diving into this thing. But uh, tell me about you're talking about, you've already talked about like business networking and that type of stuff. Um, do you have, do you already have other like acquisitions lined up or, um, I've been trying to think. How. Yeah, no, good question. So we have, a, and that's kind of what we did. We have, we have a list of potential suitors that mm-hmm. we're going to reach out and call. We haven't called them yet. Um, 
but we're we're getting close to that phase. So if any of your listeners do have a water softener company in Utah, please feel free to reach out. <laughs> um, uh, no, yeah, we've created our list and we haven't done it yet. We really want to try to prove the model first with this mm-hmm. one. Um, my brother, who's also an entrepreneur, uh, he said he has this phrase, you know, scale or nail it before you scale it, right? So that's what we're doing. We're 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 nailing it right now, and then yeah. we're going to start scaling it. I'm really intrigued by the whole thing. It's kind of the uh, the whole water filtration is what got me into this space of all things and weird things. It's a story about it, right? So I was doing a, uh, a real estate uh, thing. I hired a, a performance coach who, uh, because I thought I was getting burned out. I couldn't tell if the, I was really early stages in the, the uh, foreclosures drying up. And I was like, usually I'm pretty good about making shifts and finding new customers. And I'm like, is the market really drying up on me or am I just getting tired of this and getting burned out on it? So I hired a, somebody to help me kind of shake my own cobwebs out. I'm a performance coach. And he said, you know, Ron, it's like you should be playing a bigger game. Then after he ruined me, man, for real estate, because every time I close a deal, I, I, I close a flip on a house. It was like 40K or so, you know, and that, not to me, but to the business into the bank. And, you know, that wire would come in. I'd look at it and I'd hear his voice in the back of my head. But you should be playing a bigger game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then one day I'm a big fan of digital marketer. My master's or my MBA is in marketing. So uh, I'm listening to Ryan Dice, I think who it was on Digital Marketer, and he's talking about a company they bought. They're doing acquisitions and they bought a water filtration company and it was all industrial filters. And they realized that industrial filter was the same size and shape as something used in the residential side. So they rebranded it, sold it to those guys because they could produce it better. And then they put them online and did a bunch of other stuff and just grew this thing crazy. He, He took a a brick and mortar company that done th- certain things a certain way for a very long time came into it with a fresh set of eyes and just grew it like mad. And I, that's what got me into the space is like, you know, I like that idea of taking something that, you know, it's 30, 40, 50 years old, keeping the employees there and just opening the doors to, Hey, what else is possible with what you got here? Yeah. And, and that's, what's cool about coming into an industry or something that might be a little more, I guess, archaic or manual labor. Um, you know, my brother's business, he was in, uh, he was selling boats for my dad and he was like, he had to, you know, I think his story was he was at the movies with his family and he, a brokerage deal came through and he had to leave the show because he knew it was going to take him all night to put the paperwork together. And he was like, man, what a pain. And he created a tech company that now like 95% of all, you know, used boat market uses his software to close the deal. And so there, there's other plays too, you know, we're doing reserve, you know, recurring service contracts within water softeners, but there could be a software play. There could be a, you know, a, a manu- a parts play. There's, you know, some, a smart device. There's, there's a bunch of different things. If you have an open mind, when you get into these things, I bet there is, you think about it. So I came from, if, if you looked at my background, I came from the tech industry before and running huge data centers. And the cool thing about even back and I'm, I'm going to date myself here. I moved here in 2007. So that was the last tech job I had. <laughs> right. <laughs> and even back then, the big servers and equipment like EMC equipment and stuff, they actually uh, had a phone line uh, you know, built into them and they would call out for maintenance. So we would be working and all of a sudden the EMC repair guys would come here and like, we're like, what are you up to? And they're like, oh, no, our knock knew it. Like, I didn't p- potentially know, but our network network operation system was aware because they see in the alert, but they didn't bother because they knew EMC got the same thing, would send their tech over. But this thing mm-hmm. would send an alert out to them and they would come up, oh, you, you've got two failed drives on disk tray three. And they would just show up with everything to fix it. We let them in, they'd fix their stuff and leave. Now, that caused a problem once that and I don't want to butcher uh, EMC on the over here, but. Uh, let's just say there was one point where they fixed the wrong thing. We had EMC CEO on the on the uh, on the phone at 3 a.m. Uh, trying to 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 put a team together to to fix what they broke. They uh, anyway, but that's a software play you could do inside of these water, water software uh, soft, softener company. Have the system call out when the filtration system is is you know when the filter goes bad. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Uh, anything could go wrong inside of those filters, right? Uh, uh, if you think about it. Uh, 
50, 50 yards down the road, the, the city decides to fix the, pl- the the water system. They dig into the line. If you ever notice what happens, like here, at least here in Oklahoma, anytime the city's working on the line, you got to open it up and all of a sudden you get like muddy water looking coming out of the system. You got to run, run for a little while, right? And they'll, they'll send them mm-hmm. out warnings and stuff. But there's all kinds of stuff that could take that system down and make those filters go bad early. And having a software play inside of that would probably be cool. So, we're, you know, some type of... Um, uh, we call it there's a name for it where there's not lights out management like on the old school computers but um like intelligent device something that could sensor the water flow or something and realize there's something wrong yeah yeah no i love cool. it yeah there's there's a lot of opportunities like that so what are your uh like what is your biggest concern if you like if you, if, if if somebody called you today and said you know i've got this company it does you know in your space it does water filtration uh, we've been around for 10 years. What would be the type of things you would be wanting to know from that owner right away? Well, are there other buying criteria other than, you know, numbers that make sense to you? Yeah. Team and culture. Right. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a big believer in building the right team and, uh, also the right culture within your company. So especially in this industry, um, you just want to get a chance to team and culture are going to fit with the existing team and culture that we have going. Um, uh, because what you want is you want to, you know, when you do a roll up, you want a cohesive company. You don't want these independent companies or else it doesn't function as well. So, um, yeah, there's other, uh, outside factors that we would look at. Um, you know, market reach, size of the customer database. Um, and you know, Web presence, like that's a big thing nowadays is Google ads. We, when we bought this company, they had seven Google ads and one of them was terrible. And I said, Hey, you need to fix that before we buy the company. And I was like, honestly, I would spend up to $3,000 to fix that Google review, like go do it. And so anyway, he did it. He called him and, you know, I don't know, cost him a hundred bucks of sending a tech out there to deliver some salt or whatever. And you know, the person changed the review, right? So, and then we've been focused on that. We've gone from seven reviews to now over 260 reviews uh, on Google five-star reviews. So um, you look at web presence and things like that. Awesome. So uh, brand identity is what I would call that. Like, you know, what, is, what, is, what does the market see the brand as? And if you've got seven reviews and one of them's bad, <laughs> right? That That's not good in either sense. And neither would be, you know, having... It'd be harder, I guess, if you had, you know, 100, 200 reviews and 30% of them were bad, right? Because now right. you've got a chore. So, so yeah, you, you want to work a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. So you're wanting companies that are well, just like the rest of us, right? Yeah, they're well run. There's systems and process in place. Not that they're perfect, but they're, they're there. Um, is there a certain size? Like, you know, I know what the monetary size is, but, you know. I, I always say I'm looking for companies with 10 or more employees just because I found through the search and talking to business owners that before that stage, I'm pretty much buying myself a job, <laughs> right? Yeah. When the owner leaves, they're wearing three hats and there's nobody, there's not enough people there to pick up those hats. All right. Right. We're definitely not interested in buying a job. Um, that's kind of a phrase I've learned a long time ago is, you know, own a business, not a job. Um, and with this, you know, buy a business, not a job. So it would need to have a team, a team that can take care of the job and get things done. Um, cause you know, we can roll them under our umbrella, but we want them to have the wherewithal to complete the task without having to plug in, you know, myself or one of my partners. Now, doesn't, uh, if you're going to use the SBA again, doesn't the SBA actually have either a limit on number of loans you can have a concurrent and, or, uh, a time limit for which like from one to the other. I, I, I... Yeah, good question. So the SBA has, I think, a $5 million per person limit. So uh, depending on the size of the acquisition, we would reach that cap in you know two or three deals. Uh, but also another avenue that we could pursue is owner financing. I don't know if you've ever had anybody talk about that on the podcast. but Oh, we talk about it a lot. <laughs> Most of the guys I... Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Most of the guys I'm working with, you know, and these acquisition entrepreneurs, that's their first avenue, right? The first avenue isn't go down the path of SBA. The first avenue is see if yeah, see how much, if anything, the owner's willing to finance. Um, and 
and and pay a little bit of a premium if they are willing to. Yeah, exactly. Because what you know, if you own a finance, you you know, from the buyer's perspective, you're going to save a lot on fees, right? Even if you are paying an extra point yeah. um, to the seller, because our, I mean, for our SBA loan, you pay, I don't remember what the premium was, but between one and three percent uh, as your closing cost. So. You know, there are fees associated with it that you don't have in an owner financing deal. You know, valuation expense, all, you, know, you can read it. It's like a menu from a restaurant, all the things they charge you for. Cool. I have a resource for you on that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, but I got to give them a shout out anyway, because they featured us two months in a row. Have you, have you checked out or seen the acquisition Auto magazine? No, uh-uh. I need to. So uh, I'll send you a link to it, but the, the it's a digital magazine and the uh, this month, there's an article in there by Carl Allen, which is a mentor in the space, and he's talking about why business owners should and how to have the conversation of why business owners should do owner finance as opposed to take a lump sum from an LBO or a, or a leverage buyout. And it's talking about how they're taxed and how how that all plays. And it's a it's it's a pretty I would say it's five or six page, maybe even ten page article, but he explains it step by step on how to have a conversation, why it's to their benefit and everything. And uh, that's with uh, uh, the acquisition aficionado magazine. Um, but, you know, shout out to you. We are, a, we are in there. So it's kind of one of those, they didn't sponsor us or anything, but um, you know, the guy, I know the owner now, his name's Lynn and he's a great guy and it's a great magazine. They have some good articles in there, but there's something in there for you. Read that. If you can get your hands, I'll send you a link to a free copy of it. But uh, read that article by uh, him. It'll actually help you with that conversation. Yeah, please do. No, that, I mean, that's for sure. A lot of things, you know, a lot of people don't anticipate the tax benefit. But when you do a, when you own or finance, you actually get to defer the gain. So you only get taxed as you receive payments. Um, I did that with my previous business. And so now that gain, rather than um, getting it on my tax return all on year one, it's spread out over 15 years, right? So the, one of the best tax strategies you can do is a deferral strategy. Yeah. And the other thing he touched bases on, I was like, when the owner gets that lump sum, so you do an LBO and he gets a check for two and a half million dollars or whatever he's going to get check, he gets hits with taxes. And then he going to, what is he going to do with the money? He's going to stick it in something, right? So he has to, he sticks it into a money market account, hires a manager, he has to pay management fees on it, right? So if you really look at the total economic impact of taking a lump sum, it's greater than just the taxes to where, you know, a lot of these business owners, the whole reason they're putting in, in that money market is they just need it like a $10,000 a month retirement income. He calls it the yeah. annuity close, I think, or something to do with like annuity close. And it's like, look, they're trying to build an annuity for themselves anyway. So just give it to them as part of the, you know, as part of the transaction. So I think it's a brilliant method. So I'm going to study it and use it during my next conversation because I yeah. think it's, it's, it's both beneficial to me, of course, is it's uh, reserving capital, keeping the powder dry. So for other deals and it's beneficial to the owner. And quite frankly, the cool thing is, is if you find something, you don't, the due diligence and everything drops a lot because you can word it in your contract and say, hey, in the first 90 days, I've done this a couple of times. And the first 90 days, if I find something, it's just like, you've got skeletons in the closet. You didn't, you know, tell me I can unwind this and hand this back to you. Right. Yeah, you can be a lot more creative in your deals when you do an owner finance than when you do the SBA. The SBA has rules. Like you can't do, you know, earnouts or things like that where, hey, if, it, if, if we're able to achieve this growth within the first year, you get this earnout. If we're able to achieve this growth, like SBA won't go for that. It's like we want a price and that's what we're lending on. Right. But if you own our finance, you can even build it in. Hey, we know what. We're not going to pay you what you want. What, we, what you want. We're going to pay you this. But hey, you can have the opportunity to make that if we can grow and hit a certain you know, earnings next year. So you can have some more flexibility to negotiate as well. Man, I just looked up at the time. Wow, we're at 56 minutes already. We are at the top of the hour. I do need to make sure everybody knows how to get a hold of you. Uh, it is Vision Capital spelled with a, uh, with a Z, V-I-Z-I-O-N, Capital. But if you want to reach out to him, I'm going to turn on his LinkedIn profile link. It is Brent Parker on LinkedIn, and it's linkedin.com slash in slash Brent L. Parker. And is yep. that an L? I'll make sure that's an L, not an I. Yep, that's an L. Yeah, Brent L. Parker. Okay, cool. So that's how you reach out to you, man. One of the last things we always like to finish the show on is um, a, a very the same question that we do everybody. What can myself or my audience do for you, man? Is there is there something we can help you with? Oh man, what can you help me with? You know what? This is kind of a crazy one. Uh, I already said, you know, if anybody's 
got a water softener company in Utah they want to sell me, then you know, reach out. But that's pretty narrow. I think your audience is a little more broad. Uh, how about share some gratitude? Share some gratitude with uh, the people that work for you and work with you because um, I'm so grateful for my team. They're the reason that I've been able to accomplish what I've been able to accomplish, and people need to hear it. So share gratitude with those that uh, work for you and work with you. I think a lot of people really underestimate the acknowledgement of, uh, I mean, uh, the power of acknowledgement and gratitude. Just acknowledging another human being for the contribution they make towards you is amazing. And in said, in saying that, I want to thank you, Matt. I want to thank you for being on the show, taking time out of your day, providing your knowledge and your information to our audience. And uh, I just, I really do appreciate that. I really, uh, I know that you're, you got your own businesses to run. You've got your own path you're trying to lead and you took time out of your day to, to share that with our audience. And I, I want to thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Awesome. I'm going to end the show, hang out for a few seconds afterwards. And uh, thank you everybody for listening today. And uh, that's the show. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show. Ask questions. Uh, suggest a guest or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind. The Investors and Entrepreneurial Professional Mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer -peer mastermind introduced first in Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T I E. PM.com and check out the Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind.